Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning Live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Great to have you join us. Uh, let's take a look at how the markets are looking this morning, starting with oil. We see prices fell as a fresh COVID-19 curbs in China uh, resurfaced. The world's biggest crude importer and uh, fears of a global economic uh, slowdown weighed on the fuel demand outlook. Uh, Brent crude futures for September fell a dollar forty-seven cent uh, to one hundred and five dollars sixty-three cents a barrel in early trade, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude for August delivery was at one hundred and two dollars fifty cents a barrel. That's down about one dollar fifty-nine cents. Uh, multiple Chinese cities are adopting fresh COVID-19 curbs, uh, from business halts to lockdowns uh, to rein in the new infections. As the highly infectious BA five two one subvariant has. Uh, been detected in the country. And the Nigerian National Petroleum Company says it has secured an order from an Abuja High Court restraining the sale of shares of ExxonMobil and Nigeria units uh, to any third parties, including indigenous energy firm Seplet Energy. A statement released by Seplet's company secretary said the court had granted the NNPC an order of interim injunction restraining ExxonMobil from completing any divestment in oil mining lease uh, 68, oil OML uh, 69, OML 70, and uh, oil prospecting license. Uh, Seplet Energy, which is uh, not a party to the suit, maintains that the deal is still valid and subsisting, and is confident that the matter will be brought to a proper conclusion in accordance with the law. In February 2021, Seplet Energy PLC agreed to acquire the entire share capital of uh, mobile producing Nigeria Unlimited M MPNU from Exxon uh, Mobile for $1.3 billion. And the Nigerian Exchange Limited has lifted suspension place in the trading of shares of listed energy firm Ardova after it failed to comply with the uh, rules for filing of accounts for listed companies. A statement from the NGX mentions that the suspension uh, placed on trading on the company's shares. Uh, nearly two weeks ago, was lifted on July the 7th. Dover, which is one of the nine listed companies, uh, which were suspended on July the 1st, has now filed its audited financial statement for the year ended 31st December 2021 and an unaudited financial statement for the quarter ended 31st of March 2022. And after the break, we see our manufacturers feel the pinch of rising energy costs in the country and seeking answers from the federal government. We'll have that conversation next. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. And now to our first conversation. With rising costs of energy, the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria have asked the federal government to issue its members licenses to import diesel uh, from the Republic of Niger and Chad. Nigeria's neighboring countries in order to avert the avoidable uh, paralysis of manufacturing activities that could arise from a total shutdown of production operations. Let's uh, hear more now from the Director General of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, Mr. Shegmo Jai Kadir. Join us right here on Business Morning. Great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, uh, quite a, a demand from your uh, association regarding importing diesel uh, yourselves and getting the licenses. How exactly is that supposed to work? Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, ordinarily, as manufacturers, we shouldn't be talking about importing diesel because it's not our raw material. Uh, it's neither a machine nor a spare. But we have come to a situation where after three months of uh, uh, high prohibitive and unimaginably high cost of diesel, we are left with no choice than to seek a rather absurd uh, uh, measure to, 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 to push back at an imminent collapse. What we have seen in recent times is the fact that an average manufacturing industry can no longer operate three shifts. They have cut down to one shift. And even when they are able to run, they are now producing at a cost that they cannot sell. And don't forget that during this time, you are also paying salary. So we feel that what would be best to reduce the cost at which we purchase diesel is to seek to have a, a license to import. Now, this is, like I've said, a measure among several that we have proposed to government 
both in writing and through the media. So we are only expecting that this consideration should be uh, due consideration should be given to all the suggestions that we have made. Uh, this only being one of it. There are several others. Yeah, quite quite a number of uh, suggestions there. But is this sustainable for your members to actually import, you know, coupled with your production activities? It is not. I mean, it is not. We, we, we do not intend to do that. We don't need the licenses. We, we just want to ma manufacture. You know? The only thing we want to import is our raw materials, our machines, and spares. That's all. But now what do you do? Uh, at the first quarter of the year, you are buying this room for 200 naira per liter or 250 naira per liter. Now it is 820. And nobody will even uh, allow you to have it and pay later when you have made sales. When you consider that 80% of our members are small and medium scale industries, where are they going to get the money? Meanwhile, at the same time, you are getting forex to import your raw materials at rates that were unimaginable. Nobody expected this when they were making the projections for year 2022. We thought that we are going to recover from COVID, we are going to recover from the global logistics challenge and try to uh, put things together. But here we are, 2022, we just finished the second quarter, and we are worse than we were even in 2020. And, and it's quite interesting, even at 200 naira per liter, some were still struggling, you know, with that price, talkers of what we're seeing now. But, but what do you think the government can do at this point to create a buffer for, you know, manufacturers with this high cost of diesel? Yes, uh, thank you very much. We have asked the government to immediately introduce what we term as the national response and sustainability strategy. Because what is being blamed now is the Ukraine and Russian war. Okay, if that is it, then we need to create a strategy to beat back these challenges that we are having. I mean, we can't say because there's war between two countries, our uh, productive uh, industry should shut down. So government has to engage uh, the private sector on how we can wind down on this call, because it's all boils down to the cost of doing business. And there are so many areas of uh, pain points. There are so many pain points. Uh, for instance, uh, we actually do not have any business buying this if we have power. So one would have expected that in this conversation, we'll be able to tell government precisely, and people enter into an agreement with, uh, with government and all the agencies that are responsible about what uh, we can do to get power more adequately. Then the issue of, uh, I've been mean, making it difficult for manufacturers to assess the eligible customer scheme should be removed completely. So that will bring down the cost of production. It will mean that we will buy less of the diesel that is so expensive because, uh, that is so expensive because diesel is deregulated. So you cannot be asking for subsidies and we have never supported uh, subsidizing a commercial product. But the truth of it is that it is becoming a national tragedy. And government needs to take immediate steps. Our members may no longer be able to pay people for doing nothing. You know, we have had to bear this in the first uh, uh, two quarters, more especially in the last quarter of the year. Going forward, a lot of members are going to throw up their, are going to shut their gates because it's no longer profitable for you to produce. You cannot uh, produce and you are keeping staff. Now, you know the security situation in Nigeria. We cannot afford to turn all these workers to, to the streets. The schools are on strike. If we, if we shut our doors, we are just swelling the ranks of those who will become security risk. So I think this should be a national emergency for government to realize that it is one suffering that has gone on for too long. And I think the, the, the manufacturing sector demands a ranking consideration in this uh, at this time. Now, and, and, and that's the essence of the message. Yeah. Right. And, and, and talking about the uh, government, what has been their response so far to your demands? Unfortunately, it has not been uh, to the level that we expect. I mean, probably because uh, uh, they have not seen well, you know, we can't go on the streets. That's not, we are an advocacy group. And we continue to engage government. And we have several platforms for engaging government. And we are, we are, we are doing so. 
But the, the worry we have now is that the response is, 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 is coming too slowly. And, and there are several other areas that we had expected that at times like this, a government will consider. I mean, for instance, uh, we have the issue of the increase in excise. This is just the time not to do so. I mean, we are finding it difficult to sell because of rising costs. So we are expecting that government will take, the, the, there are low hanging fruits that government can embark upon uh, that will reduce the pressure that is on the manufacturing sector. One would have expected that all the increases in excess as part of the measures that government uh, is taking to uh, roll back the challenges we are having, is to suspend them and to give us a time to recover, to even have a conversation with us as the taxes that, that we can have rates on, on taxes, and the power uh, sector, like I've said, that NEC and the discourse should allow the, uh, to remove the uh, setbacks that we're having in assessing the legible customer scheme, and that all the regulatory agencies should slow down on the uh, uh, compliance charges that is becoming a challenge. Also at the port, it takes us about three weeks or, or three to four weeks to clear our goods. And that is another area that government can look at. So I think if we have a dialogue, we can identify those pain points that we can immediately wind down so that we'll be able to uh, have some, some breather. It is just becoming quite unbearable for some of our members. And from the questionnaire that we have sent out, it is likely that we'll be recording uh, the worst quarter uh, in a long time uh, uh, that, that we are experiencing. And looking at alternative uh, energy sources, uh, an analyst suggested that manufacturers could, you know, switch over to gas-powered plants. How do you think that's going to work? Well, I think it's a viable option, and so many of our members have been that, uh, particularly the uh, multinationals and the big uh, industry. But you also know that, uh, like I told you, 80% of our members are small and medium-scale industry. And conversion, the cost of conversion, I mean, where are you going to get it? If you are lucky, you get interest, at the, you get loan at 22% or 20%. But we have said that if you give a manufacturer any loan facility and you are charging more than 5%, you are not helping. It's just going to work for the bank. So there has to be that cost uh, for, for conversion. And like I have said before, it is, it is a, a lot easier for one to just imagine that uh, you switch to alternative uh, source or, or source of power. But there is a cost uh, content. And there is the adequacy of gas itself that is being supplied. I mean, I visited a member company, I think, about a month and a half ago in the pattern. And while I arrived there, he was conducting me around. He showed me that where uh, the, agents, the agent that is selling him gas has increased by 25%. And he did his cost analysis. There's no way he will put 15% on his uh, on, on his goods that he's selling. Nobody will buy because the ones that are being imported, apart from the fact that there's an influx and the, the company makes the target, it will become cheaper. So uh, the, the, that in itself also has its own challenge. So we still have and it cost. Is, you know, yes. Yeah, we still have cost implications for other alternatives you know, at this point. But uh, say your members don't get the license to actually import diesel. Uh, what next? No, I, I think that we, like I said, it's just one of the options. We'll continue conversation, even with those that are major marketers, for us to be able to have uh, some, some, some leeway. It, I mean, for instance, the 5% VAT on diesel to be immediately removed. I mean, so that we'll be able to have uh, access. But at the same time, we know that there's a limit to which our conversation with the marketers can go. You can't ask anybody to, I mean, to sell to you below the first price. I mean, that, that, that's a basic uh, realization that we have. So in engaging, that, uh, and, and that's why when we sit together with government and the marketers and all the major stakeholders, we'll be able to identify what can be done to bring down the price of this. Or in the, I mean, and simultaneously, for us to be able to have areas where our pain points can be reduced. Right, and and you know, talking about uh, other options, uh, can you identify those uh, other options you have available for uh, manufacturers? 
Well, for, for instance, uh, all the uh, stimulus packages that we had with the CPN, for instance, that manufacturers are supposed to assess and for us to be able to have facilities at lower rates, they should immediately be activated. Because by the admission of the, of the central bank governor himself, uh, where about one trillion was and only 30% of it had been, uh, had been uh, taken by, by manufacturers. So we need to remove the bottleneck, the bureaucratic bottleneck that has made it impossible for us to assess. That is one area where we'll be able to have some relief for the manufacturer. At the same time, we can have government squarely addressing the issue at the ports. Even for us to export, it's becoming even more, almost more difficult for us to export than to import. If it will cost you the same amount to take a 40-foot container from Singapore to Lagos than to take it from Lagos to Agbara, then it becomes a, a major issue. So government should, should remove that. What we are saying, actually, is the fact that diesel in itself is not a raw material, OK? And that if we have more power, so the best alternative is for government to ensure that we have reasonable supply of power. A situation where the national grid has collapsed two or three times or, or more during the course of the year should be addressed. And the, 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 the opportunity for manufacturers to get power at lower cost and more regularly, which has come in the form of the eligible customer scheme, should be allowed to work. If we do all of this, the pressure on the manufacturing sector will actually continue to wind down. And then we'll be able to have a conversation around how that national strategy of uh, it's not only manufacturing sector alone, other sectors of the economy are suffering. Even the people are suffering because our products are going to come out far more expensive than it would have been. So a national strategy should be able to address it in a holistic manner, such that we'll be able to have relief for manufacturers, we'll be able to have relief for the workers and the generality of Nigeria. That we don't have any sort of uh, initiative from government. I mean, uh, requires that we, we we demand for it, and that's exactly what we're doing. Right. The, the impact is indeed uh, uh, far-reaching, and I hope your members and the government can actually reach uh, consensus uh, soon uh, so that things do not uh, break down. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shegwa Jai Kader, uh, Director General, uh, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, uh, after the break, the conversation continues as Sri Lanka struggles with economic woes. What can other countries learn from this? That's our next conversation. Do stay with us. And now to our next uh, conversation. Thank you for staying on. Well, right now, Sri Lanka is making headlines globally. Uh, Sri Lanka was promised vistas of prosperity and splendor, and about 6.9 million voters opted for it, uh, subsequently providing a two-third parliamentary majority to implement the same. A little over two years later, the reality is experienced by everyone right there. Shortages of everything from cooking gas uh, to milk powder, from foreign exchange to crude oil, and now resulting power cuts. What can African countries learn from Sri Lanka's experience? We have Michael Famarati, co-founder, head of intelligence uh, stairs business, uh, joining us right now. Great to have you. Uh, great to have you, Michael. So uh, Sri Lanka is going through a lot right now economically, and uh, I'm wondering, how is Nigeria similar or different from Sri Lanka? Well, so the first thing to realize is that Nigeria and Sri Lanka share a lot of similarities. I think the best way of illustrating this is actually just to point out some of them. Um, so the first one is that for a long time, Nigeria was held up as a beacon of um, All right, seems to have a little uh, network issue there with uh, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, we'll, we'll try and get... economic development could look like of the ways that they are positively... All right, Michael, you, you froze. You froze a, a little bit there. Uh, uh, did you finish your, your thoughts there? Yes, yeah, sir. Just checking that you can hear me clearly. Okay, I can hear you now. You, you, can, go, you can go ahead. Okay, right, yes, yeah, so what I've just been saying is uh, 
in terms of positive similarities, um, both Nigerian similar, both Nigeria and Sri Lanka for a long time, at least up until let's say five years ago, were held up as um, examples of what economic development could look like in their respective regions. So Nigeria for Africa and Sri Lanka for South Asia. Um, since then, though, let's say the late 2010s, both countries have sort of taken a turn for the worse. Um, and obviously Sri Lanka's problems have um, gotten much worse than Nigeria's. But in terms of some of the negative similarities, I think it's important to highlight a few. One important one is both countries have extremely poor public finances. So just like Nigeria, Sri Lanka borrowed a lot to fund infrastructure. Um, but if you ask a lot of people there, they, they'll tell you that there's very little to show or a lot of that borrowing. Similarly, Sri Lanka's exchange rate has been managed inflexibly by the central bank for many years, which of course is something that we've seen in Nigeria as well. Um, finally, and I think this is one particularly instructive one, just like the Nigerian government has been more willing to engage with multilateral agencies like the International Monetary Fund, for a long time, the Sri Lankan government avoided engaging with them, even when the economy was taking a turn for the worse, because the president felt that it would be an infringement of the sovereignty of the country. Um, so perhaps that's a bit of a warning sign for Nigeria, because in the last five years, um, that's a narrative that we've seen echoed a couple of times. Right, and, and talking about that uh, borrowing binge, uh, some analysts have raised concerns over the over dependence on China for economic development. You know, they've likened it to uh, be a miserable option for any country. And the, the latest examples of both uh, uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, they've been facing dire financial crisis. You know, uh, presently, what do you make of this? Yeah, so there's definitely some truth in it. Um, again, like I said. The first thing to note is um, the most friendly lenders are much larger agencies like the IMF and so on. They provide very low cost funding. But the trade off there is that they are very strict in terms of the kinds of reforms and policies that you push across. The other end of the spectrum is the likes of China and so on, where they don't mind what you do, um, they're happy to give you money on almost any terms. But in the event of default, they are not very friendly. And the Sri Lankan example is great today because um, after turning away from Western lenders, after turning away from multilateral agencies, Sri Lanka heavily relied on India and China for, for borrowing. In the last 12 months, India has very been very supportive in trying to help restructure some of the debt whereas China hasn't been, right? So I think they've generally shown that they, yes, they will give you money on almost any terms, but when you know things go sour, they are not particularly friendly for us lenders. And it's important for developing countries to remember that because um, yes, it's nice to get Chinese loans, um, but when you're planning for worst case scenarios or trying to get some form of insurance, there's very little wiggle room when it comes to Chinese debt compared to even countries like India, as we've seen with Sri Lanka. And, and looking at this situation, and you know, most of these developing countries are still you know, cash strapped at this point. They're not able to get funds. What, what other option is there if you, you know, can't afford to borrow from, say, China? Well, the, the reality is, um, and this is something that every country in the world has faced at some point, the reality is that there's a time for everything, and there's a season for everything, and there's a season for austerity. And a very quick example is that one of the reasons Sri Lanka has gotten here today is that um, just before COVID hit in 2019, the government embarked on a massive spending spree and cut taxes. Now, obviously, that sounds like a fantastic policy to stimulate the economy. Unfortunately for them, COVID hit and public finances were decimated, right? So the lesson here is that spending is not always a good idea. Yes, we know that 
you need to spend to fund capex, spend spend to pay salaries and so on. But there is a time for belt tightening, and if you don't do it willingly, you will do it unwillingly in the future, and it's going to be a lot more painful. And examples from Greece, Argentina, Ghana, and Sri Lanka just begin to remind us that when people are calling for a reduction in spending, a reduction in borrowing, it's not that they're wicked. It's that they see that the government will not be able to repay the debt going forward. So it's better to cut spending now voluntarily than do so involuntarily in two to five years. And again, that's a lesson that Nigeria ought to be heeding today. And, and what are the lessons can we learn from this Sri Lanka story, apart from what you just mentioned? Yes, so one key one is um, the relationship between political and economic stability. So uh, one something that's striking about the Sri Lankan example is just how badly time badly timed things were for them, right? So I already mentioned that just before COVID, they embarked on a massive spending drive, but also just around 2019 and 2020, the president's um, strengthened his position, right? So um, after essentially hijacking the legislature, he was able to pass constitutional reforms that gave him more power. Now, at the time, although it was an unpopular move to the citizenry, it sort of made sense because you needed a strong hand to take the country through the issues that it was going through. But now today, it now more resembles a dictatorship than a democracy. And that's why you've seen the lens that citizens have gone to try and topple the government. And as we're speaking today, it looks like they've succeeded because the president has promised to step down, right? So it's a warning to Nigeria because in the last few years, we've seen the presidency informally strengthening its grip on the country. Um, we've seen the issues with the chief justice. We've seen the fact that the legislator is uh, the legislature is more in tune with the presidency. Again, these seem like good things, but citizens are watching. And when there's a sense that power is poorly concentrated and the economic picture goes sour, civil strife tends to follow. And again, that's what we've seen in Sri Lanka. Right, so so much to unpack there, so much to learn from uh, what's happening in that country. It was uh, quite interesting seeing uh, all those people uh, swimming in that uh, uh, presidential pool. Not, not, not a good one at all. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael Famarati, co-founder of Stairs Business. It was great having you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, buddy. All right, now let's uh, head on to the markets. We have uh, Willy Bong there with the details. Uh, great to have you, Will. Hi, Laddie. Good morning. I'm talking about swimming. Equities are swimming in the sea of red, you know, for yeah. the last week. <laughs> different pools. <laughs> different pools. <laughs> different markets. But it, that's, it's equities closed down 0.53% lower last week. Negative sentiments dominated trading activities. All share index is at 51,557.41 points. And particularly, we saw sell offs in international breweries, Union Bank, FBN Holdings, FCMB, and NASCON that led the weekly loss. But month to date and year to date return, with the month to date loss still remaining at 0.5%, and the year to date return is still in positive territory, 20.7% up. But also, activities was negative you know the previous week we saw volume and value was up but this week volume value and deals were down 822.4 million units of shares was traded last week valued at 10.37 billion and all over 20,000 deals sectoral performance was also bearish all key indexes were in the red consumer goods was uh, insurance was the biggest loser, followed by consumer goods and oil and gas and the banking indexes were underperformed in last week's trading session. But to give us more insight, we have Anose Asotia in our law, investment research analyst at Main Street Capital. Good morning, Anose. How are you doing today? Good morning. Thank you for having me. So now equities have closed for the second week in a row, you know, negative in July. What is this pointing to? 
Well, right now, what we see is what I would call cautious trading uh, because there are a couple, there are a couple uh, factors at play. Um, the first factor at play is that right now, we are at a critical point in the market. We are at an all-time high, a, a high that has not been seen for the last 15 years or so. And we passed that all-time high around uh, 44, 46,000 um, uh, points for the NSE, you know, ASI, the, the, the All Share Index, right? And it, it was mainly because of a lot of positive sentiment that we saw at the beginning of the year because of dividends. But you see, the market doesn't go up forever. And right now, the market has reached a certain point where it's beginning to come down. And then when you, when you now look at um, what's going on in the economy, you see that there are things that are happening that supports you know, support what is going on. One, we are and we are in an elevated interest rate environment. Um, the the MPC increased the interest rates uh, a couple of weeks ago to about 13 basis points from 11.5 um, percent. 13 percent from 11.5 percent. Now, if bond rates begin to increase, then investors will, will be more um, incentivized to move their their, their funds. From you know risky stocks, especially what's going on in the global space, to you know the more you know, the safer, the safe haven bonds, and you know that is even what we see right now in the market. People are trading cautiously, and people are looking for safer you know investments and safer bets. Yeah. So talking about the economy and uh, what is happening at the moment, so what's the bigger issue to watch for the CPI numbers? That's the inflation number is going to come out next week, or the central bank MPC meeting next week as well. Which what should investors be watching out for? What's the bigger issue here? Well, for inflation, I mean, we know that the inflation last month was about 17.71%. And then you look around you and ask, what is the difference? What has happened between last month and this month? Uh, we've seen longer fuel, um, fuel queues. Um, marketers are pushing to raise fuel prices, you know, rising debts. Um, about last week or two weeks ago, the IMF came out to say that, oh, at a constant rate, um, Nigeria will spend about 100% of our revenue repaying debts in 2026. The, the guest that you had before me talked about the issue of Sri Lanka, uh, and it seems that it seems like oh, we may be thinking. can expect that naturally um, inflation should be elevated. Now we hear that there might be increased pressure because of how you know um, high inflation is, is is rising. I mean there was an 89 basis point you know jump. From 16.82 in April to 17.71 in May, so um, we might expect there to be some pressure on the MFLA to, you know, increase or the MPC to increase the interest rates. Assuming they had not increased the interest rates at all, then we would have understood because the earlier MFLA had said that, you know, uh, he had not, he, he didn't have any plans to increase the interest rates. But uh, the fact that he increased it, you know, last month, there might be pressure for him to increase it further. If that happens. Then I mean, stocks be we might expect even further downtrends in the stock market. Mm. So how do you think equities will looking at this outlook? How trade? How will equities trade as markets resume tomorrow from the holidays? Mm. Okay, so now now we're at the point where we are beginning Q3, right? And people are analysts are or investors are expecting you know Q2 results, just as we saw at the beginning of the year. Where people wanted to really get in for dividends, you know, we might see something similar happening for you know stocks that pay interim dividends. I'm talking about stocks like NCN, um, Seplat, Standard IBTC, and you know, Zenith Bank. Now, while in the long term, the the total movement at the next couple of weeks, I believe it should you know be bearish. In the short term, we might see some bullish spikes, you know, um, or what we might call dead cat bounces, where the market comes up a bit and then ends up you know, moving lower as you know, companies that pay interim dividends and fundamentally sound stocks start to post their Q2 earnings and results. Thank you so much, Onose uh, Naolo Asot here, for your insight on the program. Uh, Investment Research Analyst, Main Street Capital. Thank you. So um, we're going to just dive back to the NASD market. That's the unlisted market and see how it traded last week. Last week, it dropped by 0.03%, losing about 3 billion naira from the market cap. That's what we have. But the market cap is still at 1.02 trillion naira. However, we saw a jump in the volume and value of deals. That's probably due to the sell-offs. Over 4,000% in volume traded last week and over 1,700% in value. Deals was at 101. Now, 
that's what we have for the market. Ladi, we are just hoping that the trend doesn't continue in yeah. this week because we're seeing massive sell-offs in terms of the fixed income space. We see that in the, for the CBN special bills. We're seeing that for treasury bills. And we're seeing that for the bond space. But we're expecting a bond auction on Monday and we're hoping that, you know, investors, maybe there'll be an uptick in yields and we see investors maybe have more buy interest and selling off, taking more risk on and not risk off, you know, sentiment. Right. Going and on uh, let's see how the first trading day is going to go mm -hmm. after all the ram eating by the investors. Of we'll course, see how definitely. Maybe more buying pressure, <laughs> sell offs. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Thank you so much, Will. All right. After the break, we head to London to stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. Still watching Business Morning. Let's head on to London now. We have Juliana standing by right there. Great to have you, Juliana. So uh, all eyes on the euro this morning as uh, it's on the brink of parity with the U.S. Uh, dollar. First time in two decades. Uh, it looks like it's going to happen. It has happened. Whilst you've been on air, uh, Laddie, right. uh, the euro is at parity uh, with the US dollar, which basically means uh, one euro uh, will get you one dollar. This is unprecedented, as you said, not happened since 2002. So um, over uh, 20 years, <clears throat> as well as showing the weakness of the euro, I think it's lost about 1.8 percent uh, this week so far. It also shows the strength of the US dollar, which has been riding high over the past uh, couple of the weeks. But back uh, to the euro. This is um, a pretty significant and it does show just how the eurozone um, economic woes are deepening. And I think this is really uh, being um, escalated because of the war in Ukraine. We know that Russia has further threatened uh, to, to, to halt uh, gas supplies to Germany. And there are concerns. I think now the big question is, what is the European Central Bank going to do? Lots of other uh, central bank governors have moved much more aggressively, including Andrew Bailey here, Jerome Powell um, across the pond. Um, the, the, the ECB haven't done that yet. Um, and now they have to, you know, try to balance a very delicate act because, of course, they want to rein in inflation. But are they going to be able to do so uh, without causing further economic woes, which is the reason why uh, the euro has fallen uh, so sharply anyway? Quite interesting. Just hope the ECB don't go too hard, you know, with the rates at this point. But uh, UK retail sales uh, decreased for the uh, third consecutive month uh, in June. I guess households are cutting back on spending at this point. Yes, uh, they are. I think most people in the UK are. We know that we're going through the worst cost of living crisis in a generation. Inflation currently at a fresh 40-year uh, high of 9.1%. And this is being reflected in retail sales. Um, and this is for June. So if you think about it, we had a four-day bank holiday um, in June to celebrate uh, the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee. And lots of people were spending money, but that wasn't enough uh, to keep uh, those retail sales high. Lots of people are holding back. Some people are going without, or some people People are going for much cheaper items um, because it is just so expensive uh, to feed their families. This inflation may be 9.1% according to ONS figures, but when you go to the grocery stores, in some places it can feel like 50%. And so that's been doubled down. Uh, the British Retail Consortium um, do say that they are expecting worse of things to come. Uh, the kind of lows that we're seeing, 1.3% year on year uh, drop, 1.5% month on month drop. We haven't seen these lows since the depths of the pandemic, even online. People are not spending online. That's dropped rapidly by about 9%. Uh, percent. Unfortunately, things may be getting worse for some people because we know that the energy cap is going to be lifted um, in the autumn. Uh, so more doom and gloom for retailers to come. Doom and gloom. I guess it's time to uh, go cheap at this point. Thank you so much, Juliana. We'll get more uh, details from you later on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now let's take a look at uh, the market now. We look at the price of Bitcoin there uh, below $20,000, and we see the fear greed index in the market showing sentiment right now deeper into extreme fear in that market is at 16 points. Uh, talking about how uh, traders see the market right now. And look at the uh, market cap there, $887 billion. That's down about 2.45%. Volume traded, uh, $53.21. A billion dollars. That's down about 1.76. We're seeing uh, sell-offs in the market. We're seeing Bitcoin there at $19,868, losing that $20,000 mark, down 0.86%. 
uh, for cent. Volume traded in Bitcoin, $24.25 billion. And we see Ethereum there uh, moving closely to lose that $1,000 mark. It's down 0.93%. We see sell-offs in that uh, asset there. It's down, it, it, uh, volume traded it's about $11.69 billion. We're seeing mostly red on the top alt uh, by market cap. All right, now let's bring in uh, our guest now, Solomon Amunde, join us right here. Great to have you, Solomon. Good morning, laddie. Yeah, so back below $20,000 again. And yeah, it's a bear market, but how do you stay profitable in a bear market? So it's it's pretty easy in the, in the bear market. Why? Because then we have less noise and we don't have so much FOMO in the market. So everything seems pretty clean and easy to follow the trend, basically. And the issue is most persons always expect the market to go up. But the easiest way to trade the market is um, follow the trend. And right now we're looking at Bitcoin making a reach for about $19,000 before we can go up a bit to about 21K. But in all, we're still looking very bearish and most likely we would see fourteen to $15,000. So right now for, for traders, you need to keep um, most of your, 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 your tokens um, in fiat, basically. Keep more of USDT and more of BUSD and other stable coins so that you can DCA into good assets, basically. Right, because we, we know what happened to that other stable coin, uh, the UST, and a lot of people lost money yeah. with that. So uh, it, it's quite scary when stable becomes unstable. But uh, talking about, you know, uh, the, the trading in the bear market, how do you spot the right project? You said there's less noise at this point, but how do you spot those really good projects? So, so basically, there are projects that have been building quietly and developing, um, it's best you focus on projects with utility, projects that are solving real-world issues and projects that you can actually create value, not um, meme coins and shit coins or projects that are based on hype. So in the bear market, focus on projects that are actually working. You know, we, we all have um, roadmaps for every project and most projects, they have not achieved up to 30% of the stuffs on their roadmap. So you need to stay clear of those projects. Focus on the ones that are undervalued and have achieved about 70 to 80 percent of the stuffs on their roadmap. Extremely undervalued keyword and also focus on the tokenomics. So knowing the undervalued projects is basically drawing a comparison from their tokenomics and also the fully diluted market cap. That's how you analyze and get those projects. Right. And uh, right now, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot is happening, you know, in this space. We're seeing a lot of these uh, uh, companies not able to, you know, uh, meet the customer needs, not uh, see most of them, you know, ha losing liquidity at this point. And we see Voyager there say they can't guarantee that all customers will receive their crypto under the proposed uh, recovery plan. What should retail be doing at this point? So um, re retail investors right now, they are the mercy of um this institutional um, backers and companies. Why? Because um, they, they should be hoping that the wheels don't pull out their phones from those platforms because um, we have wheels and we have um, retail investors. And if there's any wheel on any of this centralized platform with huge phones there and they try to pull out, obviously that will leave the retail investors stranded. So that is why we advise everyone trading crypto 40% maximum of your assets, your crypto assets on centralized ex exchanges or centralized platforms. Move the rest to the centralized platforms. That is the idea of cryptocurrency, basically. And that's the problem that the blockchain and crypto was actually built to solve from the onset. But most persons still keep 90% of their assets on centralized exchanges and they suffer it severely. Yeah, and also it's not easy being your own bank, having to keep all those uh, assets yourself. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, we've seen a lot of trends in this uh, crypto industry. We've seen uh, move to earn, play to earn, uh, the NFTs, uh, DeFi, that's still hot right now. W what else is new? What new trend is brewing at this point? Yeah, yeah we've seen them recently walk to N, walk to N like W-A-L-K. Just walk to end, which is slightly like move to end, but um, with, a, with a slightly different end concept. And that's built on, built on the Solana blockchain. 
and with the level of backers it has and work to earn actually. Work to earn and uh, my, my colleague also mentioned sing to earn might come up at some point but we'll watch out for that. All right, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so about about day. Thank you so much. Digital Market, Alice, it was great having you. Yeah, thank you. All right, now let's uh, take a look at the top alt by market cap. We see it's mostly red on that counter. We see BNB there down to uh, uh, two hundred twenty-five dollars, down zero point seven five percent. Cardano forty-three cents, that's down zero point eight eight percent. We see mostly red. A lot of sell-offs in this market, and with the correlation with uh, other asset uh, classes. Talking about the Nasdaq, there were top five gainers. I uh, was seeing quite a lean uh, gainers list there, no double digits, uh, just that uh, quant there up 9.30%, and Matic 58 cents, that's up 7.85%. And we see Sandbox, Sandbox has been creeping onto the top gainers list for a while now, it's a dollar 13 cents, up 2.01%. And we see top five losers there, it's also single digit losses with Ave, Ave leading the counter, it's down 9.80%. And uh, Uniswap. Uh, the centralized exchange there, five dollars fifty six cents down seven point four one percent. All right, that's a wrap uh, on the markets uh, this morning, and that's it. Uh, the program. Don't forget to join us at one thirty for Business Incorporated uh, for more updates of business and uh, all over Africa and the world. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.